It's time for Paleo Radio, only on Secular Media Network. You are now entering Paleo Radio. Welcome to Paleo Radio live here in studio at WPRR 95.3 FM, 1680 AM, and in affiliation with Secular Media Group. My name is Joe Elder. We have a lovely show lined up for you guys, and as I said, and you can tell from the intro, this is a live show. You can call in 616-656-1680 to join the conversation. Our lineup today is... Number one is, is globalization failing? This is by Bill Maher. Basically, he had a long conversation about it with some of his guests. Very exciting. Also, we're going to tie in uh, some of the conversation about the Brexit that we left open from last week. After that, we're moving into North Carolina and their anti-LGBTQ bill that they've been proposing and how it's actually starting to cost some serious bread for North Carolina. And maybe these uh, little social experiments for Republicans aren't that good of an idea for the citizens. Third thing is Jeremiah is going to be in at 2.30. He's going to update us about Team Tiny Dancer, give us um, just a quick recap of what's been going on in their lives in the past week and what's been going on with him. And finally, we're going to finish with cognitive dissonance, one of my favorite topics, and how Republicans and Democrats interpret events differently. This is by Aaron Schumacher of the Huffington Post. Really good article. Gets into um, some sciencey jargon as well, which we always love. Uh, First thing we're going to get into is Bill Maher. On uh, Real Time with Bill Maher last night, Bill had on guests Louise Mensch, Ari Melber, and Representative Barbara Lee, and he was discussing Brexit and the rise of populist candidates like Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders, and it signs that the working class is dissatisfied dissatisfaction with free trade and then after that he got into kind of an overarching argument which is what i think brexit is about and the rise of donald trump which is is globalization failing people because the left and the right both have their own arguments against globalization we've kind of heard it well some of them are similar some of them are a little different um Liberals have said we shouldn't be into globalization because these huge trade deals don't actually get to the people that need the help. It goes back into the corporate entities and is recycled through them the same way that the big entities in America keep the money and don't give it through and don't get it to the people who need it. They'll say that the globalist market will do the same thing. Republicans, on the other hand, have a more nationalistic approach. They'll say, I want tariffs. I don't want to have these huge, large uh, enveloping trade deals like TPP or NAFTA. And I think that those are the causes of of our problem. The thing is, there's probably a middle ground, and I think that it's one that we as Americans may not like, but we're going to have to accept the fact that because of a globalized market that we're ahead of, we have a lot of the extra things that we have. For instance, maybe the reason why we drive cars and have access to cars and open vehicles like this and the reason we have such a good economy is the fact that we prey upon people in a globalized market. So in order to have a true globalized system that helps people, Americans will have to kind of take a hit. And I don't know if we're really ready for that on the left or the right. And I think, you know, correct me if I'm wrong again, the number 616-656-1680. But I think Americans need to realize that even the military industrial complex that we have bombing people overseas um, taking the assets from poor countries to give to ourselves, that is that is a big reason why we're getting ahead in these nations. And Americans as a whole are going to have, to have to take some sort of financial hit in order to see other people get raised out of poverty. But the question is, is globalization going to do that, or can people do that through good old-fashioned nationalism and tariffs and bull moose party type of trade? Um, I think that type of understanding of it, Economics has kind of passed its time. Other people believe that it was the golden opportunity of uh, of economists everywhere and the golden opportunity for every nation to be free. I think it's debatable. But Bill Maher, he debated this exact topic, and we have a couple clips. The very first one is him just outright asking the panel, is globalization failing? And he adds on um, just kind of his opinion to it. We'll go ahead and play that. Is globalization failing everybody? Because extreme poverty in the 90s, 
was 40 percent around the world, and now it's 10 percent. Uh, it's a tough question for liberals because sometimes things help poor people overseas and are not so good for the working class here in America, and we have to decide who do we love the most, people or Americans. Well, it's they- the Fourth of July. What's your answer? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think that's a good point. He ended it kind of on a funny note there. But what are we going to choose, people or Americans? And I'm of the opinion, and I know I've been called all sorts of things for this, but I really have more of a wide-open view of my citizenship to the world than me just being an American. And I know that I've been called a hippie, tree hugger for this sort of mentality. That's okay. But for me, I don't think uh, the loss of life and San Diego is more prevalent than loss of life in, say, Turkey, like what happened here or in, in, in anywhere across the globe. Um, I don't think people 12,000 miles away have less of a right to live or, or more of a right to die, if you want to put it that way, than other people. So I, I, I'm kind of a Carl Sagan Blue Planet type of guy in this, in this political sense where I think the first chance we ever got to see the moon when we, or see Earth when we were looking back from the moon was one of the biggest photographs of all time because one of the first times we're looking at a globe without the different colors and different countries that divide the lines that don't really divide us. Now, we have arbitrary lines in the sand that say here's Canada, here's Mexico, this sort of thing. And I understand the rule of law that we need that. But at the same time, we have to look at how we approach humanity. Are we going to get it by saying this certain sect of people I identify with at these certain arbitrary lines, and therefore I want more things for them than other people, and I want more access for certain goods through that entity than other people? I think it's simply too nationalist. Um, Bill Maher also gets into talking about robots and manufacturing. Now, this is one that we, we love here at Southpaws. I know Darren... Uh, Gibson, one of the other co-hosts of the show and station manager talks about this. We, we love it, but <laughs> robots coming back to take your job. Now we laugh about it, but at the same time, we're no longer a manufacturing industry. We're no longer a manufacturing economy. We're a service industry. And Bill Maher taps into something that I think is the true grit of the globalization argument. Is it globalization or is it the fact that we need to address the problems in the job market that we actually have today? Sticking to this one, I I just think that they are selling a lie, this lie that the jobs can come back. The jobs are not going to ever come back. You know how we know? Because the factories have come back without the workers. You know who's doing the jobs? What? Robots. Robots. People are always going to be employed. If it's not one type of employment, it's another type of employment. Well, yes, but not as much because robots do the jobs people used to do. And it's a lie to tell people that that's going to, that we can bring your job back. So there you have it. Bill Maher is saying there, there's a change in industry. And so from that, if we're going to, if we're going to accept that tenant as true and say the industry has changed, we're simply not a manufacturing industry anymore. We're moving to being a service industry. What do we do from there? What are the solutions? Do we go back to trying to get more plants here that perhaps like Bill Mars kind of, uh, apostatizing about? Is it going to be a whole bunch of robot run plants? I, you know, <laughs> I think we're going to find out soon enough. I have a caller, John from Grand Junction, Colorado. I think I know this man. John, how are you doing? Doing good. <laughs> hey, thanks for the call. Yeah. Well, you're talking about globalization and that's something that I've had a very vested interest in. So, I mean, Sure. What's your opinion on it? What do you think? Well, well, globalization is all good and fine in ideals. I mean, there's it's one of those things where, idealistically, the notion of globalization works well. Um, and I think you're right about noting the um, availability of cheap products that we have. I mean, I think that's something that a lot of people who are anti-globalization, more on the conservative side, kind of forget to understand is that, you know, the ability for you to go to Walmart and buy a lot of stuff uh, for a relatively cheap price is because of globalization. Yes, um, and taking advantage of it, right? Right, exactly. And, and that's probably an example of why, for someone like me, I'm not a big fan of globalization. But for me, I think the issue is what good does it do for people to do, and it's kind of like what you were saying about the liberal perspective on it, but what good does it do to have globalization when we still struggle in America and in other countries um, to 
have a better sense of uh, the means of production being, you know, more less centralized. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Um, and I think uh, the the biggest problem that we feel maybe a lot of people who are anti globalization would be um, the bigger the picture gets, uh, it may be harder to. Um, get that less centralized, yeah. whether it be a big government or a big corporation. Well, and I think that's like uh, when we were introing the show talking about how Americans would most likely have to take a hit. We'd have to realize the fact that in order for this rising tide that's going to, you know, the rising tide floats all boats type I, uh, of idea, well, we're we're really in Panama Canal and we've got high water. <laughs> the way that Absolutely. we're going to have that happen where there's going to be a, there would be a jolt. In American right. in the American economy, and I I'm under the kind of the belief that we have more of an ability in America to innovate new jobs than other places. I'm not talking about creating them out of thin air, you know, arbitrarily, but I'm talking about we have um, just the tech booms that we have. Just in the last 20 years, the uh, dot com industry and how that exploded. How the estimation is that the internet alone in the next 10 years, every 10 years, is going to net about five to 10 billion dollars in new industry value, just in its, its existence alone. I right. think that our connections to that can can handle some of uh, of a brunt blow of lifting some people out of poverty. But I think it mostly it depends on how we look at it. If we look at it from a perspective of, I'm an American, I should look after Americans, they are, this person is, you know, from Uganda, they should look after people from Uganda, I'm not worried, you know, I don't need to worry about it. We can, I think we can take that approach, but I don't think we're ever going to have uh, a tide that rose, that floats all boats. Well, I think I think obviously that mentality is something that's developed of recent, and it's it's. I think both of us can agree it's not a good mentality. Um, America kind of has always had that idea of give me your hungry, give me your poor. Mm. Um, uh, I think for a lot of people who are um, not on the more conservative side, like myself, who would say, "Look, let's do that, but let's do it in a way in which we don't overburden ourselves. We can't do it. Where we." are made impossible to do it. I think that's where that issue yeah. comes into play. But I think for Trump and his his success and why people, even someone like me who might be interested in voting for him, is I think, you know, again, he's he's good about talking about the problem but not really about what the solution would be. Um, and that I think that problem is that, and this is a fear from a lot of people about the globalization, is that um, the value of life has gone down for a lot of people. We've not talked about that. And and to say that that's globalization's fault, I don't think it is. But I think we've also gotten very lazy in this country. And I think if you want real reforms and real changes to happen, we have to be willing to suffer. I have told you, I think, a couple of times in, in private that I think one of the best things we can do is to increase interest rates so that people can make more money off of saving. And like you said, we're more innovative. You know, we've always been known to, to be more... Uh, innovative with what, what we can use. That's always been the American spirit. And I think for some reason we've gotten ourselves lazy because, let's face it, um, a select few have gotten very rich off of foreign oil and uh, have kept us in that. You yeah, know? And, and it's also the reason why, like we were saying too, um, or at the start of the show, it's also why we have vehicles in our driveways that we can drive at an affordable rate for all of us to be able to most likely have, or a good majority of our citizenry. Um, right. The, the one thing I would say too is, with Donald Trump talking about the issue, I, that's kind of what I'm asking is, is globalization actually the issue? Or or if we're looking at it from a realistic standpoint, if the majority of the world is going into these huge, large trade agreements and other countries that are the nation, the national leaders or international leaders of the day today decide, I'm going to abdicate from that process and I'm going to do it my own way, is that over time actually going to be sustainable, especially if there's larger and larger trade agreements being buried on top? So it's it's fighting an ideology, right? If if we if we believe global globalization is a problem, do you fight it with nationalism, or how do you do it? In my opinion, I don't really think that it's even a problem. I think it's kind of an inevitability, just like robots creating and working in manufacturing jobs is an inevitability that we kind of have to face. Well, I, I, I think that globalization, much like the other issues that we're facing in America and our economy that's causing us problems like um, automation, and we can talk about it. And I know from someone, from your perspective, the more scientific advance we get as a society, the better. For me, I, I, I think that 
as America, part of the problem why nationalism is appealing to a lot of people is we've forgotten our national identity and having a sort, a sort of pride in producing products, local products. And I think there's a reason why people are becoming more and more now. It's no longer a fad. I think it's, a, it's, it's here to stay. People buying local, local organic crops, local, oh, yeah. you know, handmade crafts. Sure. Um, where there is, you know, you're willing to pay more for something that actually yep. has been made with care. And I think that's the question. Yeah, I, I agree. Great points, John. Thank you for your comments. And All side right. note, love you, buddy. You're a fantastic you human being. Thank you for the call. <laughs> All right, bye. All right, I have one more clip to play, and then we're going to go right into our break. But this is Bill Maher basically talking about the industry changing and what government's role possibly should be with the change of the change from manufacturing into a service industry. Isn't the job of look what's happened in this country? I think all over the world, but mostly in this country, is that we're a consumer society. We're not a manufacturing society anymore. And, and those kind of jobs, service jobs, pay less than manufacturing jobs. Isn't it politicians' job to figure out how to pay more yeah. to people in service no, jobs? Because what, what that's where done, the jobs yeah, but what are. We have... Isn't the job of... Look, what's happened in this country, I think all over the world, but mostly in this country, is that we're a consumer society. We're not a manufacturing society anymore. And and those kind of Sorry, we had that live always what happens in live radio, a short little uh quip electrical difficulties or mechanical difficulties. But Bill Maher basically gets on to the point where he says what is the main goal of government? If we see that the jobs have moved to this market, is our job to bring things back to other markets as a government entity, or is our job to focus on where the job is and where the price range and the price index of those jobs are and raise that? And I think that he gets to the main point. Um, we're going to have to take a quick break here. The very next topic we're getting into, one that we always know and love, is North Carolina, their anti-LGBTQ bill that they've, they've been trying to propose and how it's costing them some money. Stick around. We're going to be right back. Back to Eagle and Dragon. Welcome back to Paleo Radio, live here in studio at 95.3 FM, 1680 AM, Public Reality Radio. I'm Joe Elder, and again, we've got all those electrical difficulties, technical difficulties sorted out. The wonders of live radio, when it's good, it's great. When it's bad, it's bad. So, hey, we've moved on amicably. We have a caller on the line, Gregory Vining. This is our buddy from Holly Ridge, North Carolina. How are you doing? Hey Joe, how you doing, big guy? Oh, I'm I am fantastically well, sir. How are you? Oh, I'm doing good. I'm down here in North Carolina. It's so hot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's actually the same in Michigan. We're having some wonderful weather here today. And I want to tell change. a quick story to you about the um, with the subject you're about to talk about. Sure. Pat McCrory, North Carolina LGBT law. Um, <clears throat> I am interested in this topic because obviously I live here, and ironically, Pat McCrory just asked. Uh, the North Carolina legislature to borrow five hundred grand to uh, cover some of the costs of businesses moving out of North Carolina. Yes, yep, I, that's exactly what we're going to be covering. You nailed it. Half a million. Here's the thing: I lived last year in October in Calabash, North Carolina. It's the southernmost part of North Carolina, bordering South Carolina, and uh, my house flooded. I was renting a house. My house flooded. Uh, I was one of dozens of homes in that area that flooded due to poor irrigation uh, in the area. And because I was renting, I didn't have the option to get FEMA flood insurance. Mm. I lost probably $10,000 worth of stuff, my couches, my bed, furniture, clothes, all this sort of stuff. So, uh, you know, I went and I said you know, to my town, I said, hey, what's going on with this? And they said, yeah, Pat McCrory has to uh, sign off on a disaster relief, uh, he declared a disaster area, which much of South Carolina did. And uh, he never did. I never got any assistance through the government uh, for, for any of the flood damage. And I just, I'm not saying that I needed it or whatever, we're okay now, but it's just kind of ironic that now he decided not to spend the money when people needed it, and now he wants to borrow it from his own yes. ignorance. And, and so, and yeah, and just to fill in fill in kind of the gaps for anybody, uh, WRAL and Raleigh reported this um, yesterday. 
This year's budget technical corrections bill set aside 500 grand to defend North Carolina against lawsuits over the controversial House Bill Number Two. But exactly like you're saying, Gregory, um, it transfers $500,000 from the state's Emergency Response and Disaster Relief Fund to Governor Pat McCrory's office to order and handle litigation over House Bill Two. So they're directly taking it from the Emergency and Disaster Relief Fund that North Carolina has uh, to deal with it, which in a way makes sense because it is kind of a disaster. It's not a natural disaster, but it sure it sure has been a disaster for for the state. And uh, you know, uh, they just don't want to uh, talk about uh, you know it's no deal on on discussions on it. From what I've seen about it, I just thought it was a good place for me to pop in and say hello and kind of drop my my little story about how I think that there's some some subtle irony here in that whole situation. Yeah, so it just shows that it, this is something, the, again, at Bill Maher, maybe I'm fanboying too much by bringing him up twice here, but he was talking about the same thing and how these are scientific experiments almost in different state legislatures, like seeing the Republican experiment of austerity versus the liberal experiment um, that there is going on in California with being very progressive in their laws. And I think it's just an interesting take on Everything that's going on, you can see pretty well if a state is red or blue and how well they're doing economically, especially nowadays. Yeah, they definitely boasted uh, last year after the storms. And again, my my town, which is the southernmost, the one I used to live in, uh, was which is the southernmost, and got hit pretty hard. I mean, it, it was it was really messy in that area. And um, you know, he was uh, Pat McCory got up and he was boasting about how they're saving so much money and they're, you know, this is why you know Republicans should be in charge. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, <clears throat> you went from you know boasting about being fiscally responsible, which is good. That that is always good. It's good to be careful with taxpayer money. But at the same time, if you're going to use the money to legislate against Charlotte's town ordinance, which is how this whole thing got started, yes. Charlotte started with uh, basically a bill or an ordinance that said, hey, we want to be inclusive, we want to say something about it. It was a pretty vague law from my understanding. And um, right before it was supposed to go into effect, 12 hours in the state legislature, they came out and voila, you have House Bill 2. Wow. So, and and then since you're from the state, can you kind of fill us in a little bit or just let everybody know? House Bill 2, exactly what is, what's the re- referendum on that? What is their plans with House Bill 2? Or, and what does it actually do? I, I have had, you know, obviously they, there are mixed reviews, and I haven't read the actual bill. So understand this is just my own understanding of the bill. Mm-hmm. Basically, the city of Charlotte, the town legislature, said we want to be inclusive of trans people, and we want people to, you know, go to the bathroom they identify with. It was a relatively benign um, piece of legislation, which I agree at the same time as HB2 maybe was an unnecessary bill. So I will give them that. Maybe they didn't really need to say that because, again, it hasn't been a problem. But um, right before it went into effect, state legislature came out and said, here is the law of the land. Birth certificates need to be provided uh, at the bathroom, at least for state buildings. I'm not sure how it affected private businesses. But a birth certificate. Yes. So you have to carry a birth certificate around to go to the bathroom? One of the big criticisms is that it's entirely unenforceable. But sure, sure, but yeah, continue on. This, this is it's, it's really interesting to hear from someone who's from the state talk about it. Yeah, uh, yeah. well, I downloaded the app uh, so that I could listen uh, out of town. Uh, I, I really wanted to be able to call in, which is working yeah. out great. Well, thank you. <laughs> so... Anyhow, so the bill comes out and they said, listen, this is the law of the state now. This cannot be changed in any city ordinance. No city ordinances are allowed to basically go up against this and contradict this law, which is also interesting when you're talking about small government, because they say we're for small government, and then on the state level, you know, sweeping law for those below them, And, you know, I think Pat McCoy is probably the kind of guy who would be happy to complain about federal laws affecting states. And it's the same thing, except it's the state legislature controlling the cities where they're saying, Charlotte, you can't do that. Here's a law now that says you can't do it. Yeah. And I think this is my own opinion on the whole entire um, aspect of the North Carolina law. But I actually think in these cases, and I, I 
I upset everybody on this angle. I think you do you do nothing. You don't pass a bill that says you can go into any bathroom that you want, and you don't pass a bill that says you have to go in by your gender identity. And we have to look at a solution that's more middle ground. I, I think so. I know that people have said – they've said things like I'm bigoted for having this view, but my point of view is I'm not going to go all the way – as far as everybody else wants me to go on this issue, I just simply don't agree with everything about it. But I I agree in equal treatment for everyone, and I agree with equal access to the same buildings as everyone does. And I have nothing against the transgender community either. But I think unisex bathrooms is the answer to the bathroom issue. Because after you get into gender fluidity as well, where people identify on different days what gender they are. And it unless we're going to have just co-ed bathrooms... Or we're going to have unisex bathrooms. I don't. I don't think there's a middle ground. I think that we're either heading towards having co-ed bathrooms or we're having unisex bathrooms, like outside of a stadium where people use the um, porta johns and don't seem to have as much of an issue. What do you think about that? Well, I, I like to clarify a couple of things, and, and this is sure. something that I feel like falls through the cracks a lot, which is that when the North Carolina legislature goes in and says something about, say, a bathroom law, it's not a bathroom law. For private businesses. Private businesses can do whatever they want. So what they're saying is we can legislate on government property, government buildings, schools, legislative offices, yeah, DMV, whatever. Way worse. <laughs> Doesn't it? Yeah. I think that makes it way worse. It does make it worse, but it's a common misconception that people say, well, I think this is what we should just do. True. And I think a lot of the times they're talking about we as in the entire population. A, a small business, any business, can organize the bathrooms in whichever fashion they wish as long as they're within building code. Sure. Which I think that's a great – yeah, that is a good point, and that's correcting my error there, which is I, I was under the understanding it was a statewide bill, a statewide code that would they, apply to private businesses as well. You know, But I also think, too, it, I just think the answer to these sort of things – is not you can't police someone with a birth certificate any more than you can police someone who says they identify as something in that sense where I know they're trying to do it with the birth certificate but that's a perfect example you know I know in my life and I have I have no qualms about this in any way shape or form I know I've used the restroom with transgender people I know I have I haven't known the difference and I don't think it's a big deal but if you pass that North Carolina bill you have people that have been going into the bathroom that they identify as right now without an issue that will now be forced to go into a bathroom where if they looked like if they look mostly like a man like I do and they've been going into the men's restroom now by law they're committing a crime they're going to have to be going into the women's restroom if they haven't had some sort of sexual reconstruction which I think is just none of anybody's damn business you know I just don't think the state should get that close into people's sexual orientations or identities as far as what they believe about it. They just need to protect them. We could talk about it for days. Days. Hey, man, you end up staying on for the whole segment. How wonderful is that? Thank you for the call, though, and thank you for the information. Thanks for having me, Jeff. Yeah, that was Gregory Vining, one of our very good friends and also a very, very big part of Paley Radio. He helps us behind the scenes. Fantastic human being. Up next, we have Jeremiah Bannister in studio. He's going to give us a quick update about Team Tiny Dancer and their family. Stick around. We'll be right back. Now back to Joe and Jeremiah. Welcome back to Paleo Radio again live here in studio, 95.3 FM, 1680 AM, Public Reality Radio, and in affiliation with Secular Media Group. I have my brother, my buddy, back in studio. It's true. I'm the evening emperor. And actually, it's crazy because normally we record in evening time, and right now we're totally live. And I want to say thank you, Nathan, for that introduction because... He said, now welcome back to Joe and Jeremiah, yeah. and it wasn't just Joe. And it was wonderfully done, yeah. yeah Thank well, you, Nathan. Wonderfully for done. You're a genius, Nathan. <laughs> so, a lot of things have been going on in your world, man. What's What's been going on? I got it. Let me say this first, man, because I'm not in here very often. I was listening to you. I, I came in, you know, we've had a crazy week here, a crazy weekend, actually, so far, and I've got a lot to say on this, but as I'm listening to you, I came in during the first segment, and I heard you talking to John, and he's an old friend of mine. I've known him probably almost a decade now since YouTube. And uh, I'm listening and I'm like, man, I just, I'm chomping at the bit. I got so much I'd like to say 
about globalization. And you and I, that's one of the issues you and oh, I yeah, disagree. We talk about it extensively. Im- immigration and globalization are two issues that you and I don't see eye to eye on very well. But I said, man, there's a lot I want to say. But then the second topic came up. And you started talking. I said, "I am glad I'm not in that room right now." <laughs> yeah. Hey. Hey. Yeah. You know, but I, I truly believe. I truly believe yeah. in. If you have a right or you have a defense to your position, you take it and you explain what it is. And hey, I'm. I'll take it as it is. Well, you're a powerhouse, Joe. Thank you. So, anyway, stuff to do with Team Tiny Dancer. Um, for people who don't know exactly what that is. Uh, it's not just the song playing in the background. That's right. right. Which is a great well, song, a fan- but it's not that's just where, that. That's where it came from, right? It came from this, uh, from the song being shared. But but Team Tiny Dancer is the name that we have for uh, our family, the Bannister family here in Grand Rapids, in our battle over the last year and some uh, with childhood cancer. My eldest daughter, she's 12 years old. Her name is Samantha. And she, she's been dealing with a grade three anaplastic astrocytoma since, since March of 2015. And I was on last week and I'd encourage people, if you, if you want to kind of catch more up to speed, other than going to check out my Facebook page at facebook.com slash jeremiah.banister or just look up hashtag team tiny dancer. There's like a ton. Uh, you can find everything going that way. Uh, but go back and check out last week's show. You can do that by, Visiting Spreaker and check out the Paleo Radio Show Spreaker page, and you can download it, listen to it any time. And I came on around the same time last week, too. And it, yeah. this is how it'll play out, and I explain why it's playing out this way. So over the last week, I there's been a number of developments. Um, some of them have been not very good, right? Some of them, I, I wish that I could just simply come on here and say something really happy and, and amazing. And there's going to be, there's a silver lining to all of this, but I'm going to drag you down to the bottom of the ocean with me for a second. Um, over the last week, we went to starting with the CFI summer camp. Okay. We went to the summer retreat. C, uh, CFI is an organization I'm a board member of. I'm a board member for Center for Inquiries, uh, Michigan chapter for the whole state. And they invited us, uh, free of charge actually, to go to this retreat. So we did. And we went last year and had a great time. But there were things that were a little different this time around. Uh, Samantha's cancer recurred, of course, in December. Uh, it spread as of March, and it's been growing and getting bigger and actually spreading to now three places in her brain, uh, two in the thalamus near the ventricles and one near the frontal lobe. And these, there's a ramification to this. Cancer doesn't grow in the brain with no effect, right? I mean, that just is not real. So you're going to deal with whatever area of the brain – that it's growing in and what that area of the brain does to the person. Okay. We're not talking about spirit stuff with the will and the thoughts and the yeah. feelings, right? Do that. <laughs> talking about how the, the brain works. We're talking how the brain works in reality and you have to, you have to face this. So we talked to her about it and she said, well, what's the, what is the frontal lobe? What is this about? And so we talked about it and what the ramifications of this would be. And so over the past week when we went to CFI's summer retreat, she was extremely tired. And she sleeps most of the day now. She wakes up. She's hungry. She'll wake up, maybe watch a movie with us partway through. She kind of dozes off and stuff. And so we just allow her to to rest and to sleep a lot. Um, but there's been other things, you know. This week, we um, when I was at when I was at the retreat, I laid her down to go to bed, and we were just enjoying our time with people. And I said, you know, she's been asleep for like three hours. I'm going to go. And I'm going to talk to her. And so I went into the cabin where she was laying alone in the dark. And I tried to wake her up. And she would not wake up. Mm-hmm. And I tried valiantly. I tried at first to tickle her. Right? Then I tried to kind of nudge her. And then I grabbed her shoulders and I started shaking her. I literally smacked her in the face. And then I just held her with her head real close to mine, and I pressed my my mouth up against her ear, and I whispered over and over, please wake up. And after about 15 times of doing this, she opened her eyes and she said, what do you want, Papa? (laughs) And I'm thinking, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is is insane, you know. Welcome to the roller coaster. This is a ride. And so... That kind of stuff was happening. And then when she would walk around, she was having a harder time. And so we decided we're going to push her in her wheelchair. And and for anyone who's tried pushing a child on a dirt path in a wheelchair, (laughs) in a wheelchair in the middle of the woods, 
believe me, it is not easy. Yeah. It is a very, very hard thing to do. <laughs> yes. And But Papa, I sat there, and I, Angela and I both, and we had people around who were flashing lights to make sure that we could see in front of us, see any sticks or stones that could break her bones, yeah. right? I mean, for real. And so we... Uh, we did things like that, but having to push her more because she can't walk as well. You know, when she walks, she veers to the right. It's almost like a car that's out of alignment, and it veers to the right, so you have to hold on to her. Her right side is what has experienced the most paralysis since this, since the beginning of this. This has been the main thing. And this week, as I'm helping her go up the stairs, she put her right leg up like normal, and it buckled. And she looked at me, and I grabbed her in time. Yeah. Um, and it, was, it wasn't a problem. There was no damage done. It, she, it's not like she did a squat or anything. It was just, but it was quite obvious that if I hadn't grabbed her, she would have fallen. Mm -hmm. And she looked at me, and she said, sometimes my brain doesn't communicate with my leg very good. And so now she cannot go upstairs or downstairs alone anymore. And so we are always near her. She will often, she's been forgetting things. You know, taking her meds and about five minutes later, ten minutes later, reminding us that she needs to take her meds. Mm -hmm. You know, repeating things. These things are real. And then a couple days ago, I went to go lay by her side. And she was laying down. She was sleeping. And I went to go lay down or sit down by her. And when I did, I put my hand down and I realized that she had urinated in her sleep. And now she does kind of a pee-pee dance. But the part of her brain and the part of everyone's brain that says, get up and go, that part of her brain is, is being attacked right now by a vicious, vicious cancer. And she will shake and move and not entirely understand why. And so now we have to make sure to take her to make sure that she can go. You know, her vomiting has gotten more and we're seeing it a lot more where this is happening. So all of this has happened in a week yeah. since we spoke last. And we were down and out. I mean, we'd been calling around and trying to get her information to different hospitals, trying to get anyone to say something that was hopeful, something. Because Helen DeVos Children's Hospital, there wasn't hope there, right? It was kind of bring in hospice, call the family around, and we weren't willing to do that. So U of M kind of said the same thing, said, well, maybe we can do a chemo. We can try that. Maybe that will uh, help out a little bit. But that's not what we want either. That can't melt cancer. That's literally saying it's going to happen. This is an inevitability. We're not going to be able to melt it back down. There's no more surgery. There's no nothing. And I refused. We refused as a family. And so we called, and finally we got a hospital called Beaumont Hospital in Royal Oak, and they said that they would be willing to have a meeting with us. And it was the radiology department. And come to find out, there's a technique that's cutting edge. It's in, they're following clinical pathways right now to do this. It requires specialized equipment and people who know what they're doing. Sure. Right, connected with some of the greatest minds of cancer in this entire country. And this guy's name is Dr. Chen. And he's an amazing human being. And he's reached out to us many times, even off hours, to make sure that we're up to date with what's going on. But we had a meeting with him yesterday. And as the meeting was going, I, I wasn't entirely sure how things were going to go. I mean, she, she vomited inside the hospital over her clothes and her wheelchair, but they were all there to help and to make sure that she had gowns. And as they're talking, I'm starting to realize that it sounds like they're going to say yes. And Dr. Chen comes in and he says, listen, we need to set you up for an appointment because we are going to do this technique. And what it is is this, is that when people go in for radiation normally, especially with aggressive tumors, they blast it all in one time. And they blast it with, for about 10 minutes. You know, So the person's laying down in the, on, on the bed in the chamber there, and for 10 minutes that radiation is attacking that, it, it, like 200 units or something like that. What they're doing with this, this is amazing medicine. This is amazing science, folks. It's saying, how can we do this so that it can attack, maximum attack on the tumor with minimal damage on the brain? And they said, because we're going back in and doing this again. It's risky business. Mm -hmm. Other hospitals say no. And they said, what we have to do is instead of giving 200 units at a time 
Instead, we give, let's say, 20 units for two minutes. Pause for three. Two, you know, 20 units for two minutes, pause for three. And do that all together for 45 minutes a pop. Sometimes they will divide it up at different times throughout the day. So people come in and they do it that way. And the whole idea, and this is genius, the whole idea is to say, how can we attack this cancer and yet give the surrounding portions of the brain enough time that the DNA can begin to recover, recover, Mm -hmm. but yet not give it enough time for the cancer to do the same. And so so, it's a a race. (laughs) It's a race. This is literally a race. And they said, yes. Now we were there (laughs) when they they said yes. I mean, I'm just, I was just bawling my brains out over this. And I hate to to pop a bubble with this for anyone who's following the website because uh, I said that we were going to have a test tomorrow on Sunday. That was what we were told. And there's a cool story behind it, but time doesn't afford it. You have to go to my Facebook page. So (laughs) the thing is, is I got a call this morning uh, to find out that um, the machine that they need to do to use for this is not going for the MRI to in preparation is not going to be available at all. There are no uh, availabilities until Friday. Now that doesn't sound like very long, but after describing the past week to you, I think you can understand why it's not necessarily the one thing I wanted to hear. Yeah. And so we're holding strong and we're surrounded by amazing people. I mean, not just at Helen DeVos, not just at Beaumont, but the, the army of people that identify with Team Tiny Dancer, they've even started posting hashtag Team Tiny Dancer for life. I mean, people love her. I mean, you can't, what is, yesterday I think we had 600 likes all together <laughs> on two posts. It's unreal. I mean, I, I've never seen anything like that yeah. uh, on my wall ever. And I said people sharing it, people calling and reaching out to say, what can we do to help? What are things that we can do to bring greater awareness to Samantha and to your situation and to the situation of other people, right, that are going through hard times like this? And so it's been a crazy week, Joe. Yeah, it's been <laughs> a lot. It's gonna, it, it's a lot. But next Saturday, I'll probably have to call next Saturday. I may not be back in town. I can't promise that I'll be back here. If I am, if I'm back in town, I'll be back in the studio. Uh, but if I call, no matter what, people are going to get an update about the various tests that, that have to be done throughout the week. Like, for example, is the last thing I'll mention. Uh, there's a test that uh, they want to do. I don't know if it's called a trax, traxonomy, whatever it is. They, they, they said because the cancer is spread, they want to know where the tendrils of the cancer are going. What's the pathway that the cancer is using in the brain in order to spread and show up in other places? And the reason why, and this was so powerful, Joe, this was so powerful to hear. Because Dr. Chen looked at me and he said, Jeremiah, he said, I want it all gone. I don't want any of this there. I want it to go. And he's a determined guy. (laughs) I am so happy. So you're in good hands. Oh, you better believe it, buddy. We are in fantastic hands. So listen, if people want regular updates, you're going to have to go to my Facebook page. It's easier, actually, if you just go on Facebook, go to the search engine part at the top where you can look up uh, pages or people and interests. And instead of doing that, just put in the pound symbol, the hashtag, and Team Tiny Dancer. It's all one word, Team Tiny Dancer. And you can see tons of people who are sharing the story. And follow follow me. And make sure when you follow to set your settings so that you see first. Otherwise, sometimes it just kind of gets in the blur. And make sure to follow this man for his political ideas as well. (laughs) You're a formidable opponent and a fantastic (laughs) co-host, man. I love Uh, you to death, buddy. Thank you for joining us. I love you, Thank you you for the update. Thank you. Up next, we're going to be talking about cognitive dissonance, Democrats, Republicans, all that good stuff. For debates, interviews, or speeches, contact Paleo Radio Show at gmail.com. You love to hate them, you hate to love them. You just can't get enough of them, you sick freaks. Paleo Radio's on the air. Welcome back, Paleo Radio, 95.3 FM, 1680 AM, WPRR, and in affiliation with Secular Media Group. Thank you guys for sticking with us. The topic of conversation, cognitive dissonance. Our friend that we all have, and some of us know we have, and some of us don't. This is an article out of Huffington Post. 
How Republicans and Democrats Can Interpret Events So Differently. This is by Aaron Schumacher. Now, she focuses originally on the Benghazi report that just came out, which, um, and this is the interesting thing about cognitive dissonance, depending on what article you read or what news article you read, this was either in a, an immense takedown of the U.S. government and their mishandlings of this event, or it was a know-nothing show, Clinton didn't do anything wrong. It just depends on the news sources that you read. So I highly encourage you guys to go into this article because she talks about that exact thing. And we're going to get into it right now. Depending on which news source you read, House Republicans' final report on Benghazi, the investigation that ended Tuesday, either uncovered no new wrongdoing on the part of Hillary Clinton and the State Department or slammed both parties for inaction and lax security prior to the 2012 terrorist attack in Libya. As the Washington Post rightly notes, news outlets reported the facts and reported them similarly, but framed the report in very different ways. So it has a picture here of the New York Times on the left and the Washington Post on the right. New York Times reading Benghazi panel finds no uh, misdemeanors or no things wrong, no wrongdoing by Clinton. And the WA Post says Republicans on Benghazi panel rip U.S. response. So you have obviously the same exact report comes out. You have multiple different opinions. Why do people come to the opinions that they come to or the conclusions? They come to one possible explanation for the high line discrepancy is confirmation bias, a psychology and social science term that means interpreting new information that conforms with what you already believe to be true. If you believe that Benghazi involves an Obama administration cover up, well, then you might choose to read the headline that depicts the report as damning and an indictment of Clinton in the State Department. On the other hand, if you think Republicans have been picking on Clinton over the last two years for partisan reasons or because she's a woman, you might click on the headline that reads that Clinton had done no wrongdoing. In other words, your past assumptions and knowledge color the way you see the world, from the way you interpret news stories to news stories in the cho- in how you choose to consume them in the first place. Does this hit a little too close to home? It should, because we all do it. According to a 2009 paper published by the American Psychological Association, a meta-analysis of 91 studies and nearly 8,000 subjects found that people are, mo- are almost twice as likely to seek out information that confirms their existing beliefs than they are to investigate information that would challenge those existing beliefs. And we see that every single day. I mean, this is, this is why, and I know this always comes from left field, and it does for me, but I'm bringing it anyway. It's why I love science, man. The best thing about science is it acknowledges the fact that cognitive bias is built into our conclusions. So how do you fight against it? By having repeatable evidence over and over so you can't contradict it. You can't use your own assumptions to conform to it. You can only prove it in the lab. And that's why it's such a difficult upholding. It's it's such a difficult thing to actually do. But it's so necessary and it actually gets you to the truth. It's not just a problem amongst lay people either, and this is this goes right into what we're talking about. Designing double-blind studies and having a reputation for objectivity, scientists are as suggestible as the rest of us. Quote, There's clear evidence in the literature that people tend to look for errors in their analysis only when they get a surprising result or effect. Saul Perlmutter, a Berkeley professor who won the 2011 Nobel Prize in Physics, told the Berkeley News last year. Quote, This leads to people re-examining their analyses, and since there are often alternative approaches and or subtle hidden bugs, the final conclusions typically, typically end up more in line with the previous results. So basically, if you come to the conclusion that you wanted, you don't double-check your studies. If you see something that seems out of norm to what your conclusion was, they'll go back and kind of try to rework the study, which is our human nature. So what what stops that? The peer review process stops that. Somebody who doesn't have the same bias as you gets to look at your study and confirm if it's true or not. Well, that has a huge implication on the things you say. For instance, earlier in the show, we were talking about the experiments that Republicans are making state by state as well as experiments that liberals are making state by state. Um, And you can see, look in California where you've taken – only liberal principles and look in a place like Kentucky where you have Matt Bevan who takes over as governor and wants to put in austerity to the max. And here's your experiment. Whose, whose ideological arguments are actually backing up what they say? Now, I, the left is in some cases, they're not perfect. They definitely have their holes. But the idea of cutting your way to prosperity obviously isn't true if you look at Kentucky or Kansas or Alabama, where these are places that have blown surpluses based on austerity. So use the evidence. 
When it comes to consuming news, especially polarizing articles about issues you think you already understand, like the Benghazi investigation, it doesn't hurt to pick up a newspaper you won't normally read and keep the eye rolling to a minimum. Now, this is something that here at Paleo Radio we buy in a big, big way, is praise where praise is due, criticism where criticism is due, and Everyone gets credit for their own ideas, and it's regardless of what party you're in. If you have a good idea, we support it. If This is one thing that I, I have a, a bit of a craw against liberals on, but I'll openly admit it, is when you see a Republican doing the right thing, credit them for it. Don't, don't play the game of, yeah, they did this one time, but there's so many things they've done wrong. You're right, but support them on the things that, they, that you feel they've done correct. And Republicans need to do the same for Democrats. But that's how you bridge the gap is you can say of a guy like Paul Ryan, Paul Ryan goes up, what was it, two months ago and tells people that he thinks he was wrong about a lot of socioeconomic things. He thinks that he had a, a view of it that he doesn't previously hold or that he previously held that upon reflection just does not seem to hold water anymore. And he feels like he needs to change his ideas. Good for Paul Ryan right there. That's fantastic. Doesn't mean he's going to come to the same conclusions that I do. But it is an area where I feel he's corrected himself and he needs to be praised for it. And when someone realizes that, I think it's a, it's a magical thing. We all can do it. But cognitive bias is, it's such an important role. It plays such an important role in all the decisions that we make. And you know, you do it. I do it as well. Hey, if someone's, if someone's going to tell me, that creationism is real over evolution, I don't necessarily go and, and Google get Ken Ham to ask about how to f- solve those problems. I go to the Smithsonian, and I have my own ideas of what I believe to be true. The, the inherent difference is you have to read the other side's arguments. You have to read the other side's arguments. And it's only two minutes to the show, till the end of the show, but this is another one that I, I have to urge people to think about is – Think about hearing the other side of the argument, especially in a college campus, especially if it's against what you believe. You know, um, you have to be able to have someone who has a contradicting view be able to voice their opinion and analyze it and come to your own conclusions. But the idea of saying this person has what I assume is a bigoted response or a racist response, I don't want to hear it at all, I view that as a serious concern. We need to let people voice those opinions, and I know they're bad opinions. We all know they're bad opinions, but when they're voiced, you can refute them. Make them bad opinions by example. Make an example of the person saying it, and not to refute them, but refuting the arguments. If it's a bad argument, you can still bring it up, and it won't hold water, and we really retain that here at Paleo Radio. Unfortunately, guys, it's the end of the show, but thank you guys so much for joining us. Thank you, Jeremiah, for coming in, Gregory, John, for the calls. We appreciate it, guys. We love you. Don't forget to like Paleo Radio on social media, on Facebook and Twitter. You can follow us on Spreaker. Have a happy 4th of July, everybody. We will see you next week. Listening to Paleo Radio, exclusively with Secular Media Group.